Hey, hey, y'all see it? Air Nolan over Julian saying. That's all I'm saying, bro. You want to put some respect on my boy name? He's in college football, and this week is evidence of that because this is a down week where we're supposed to be talking about the divisional playoffs in the National Football League, and lo and behold, we have mountains of news and really important stuff happening in college football with some of the biggest brands in college football. So let's get into it. Um, Alabama, the uh, wake of Nick Saban leaving, the, you know, the, 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 remnants of what's going on there uh, remains to be seen and it's continuing and they're losing some really good players. Now, the question becomes like, should we be worried? Because anybody can can hit the panic button and there's some good players leaving and, and anytime any good player leaves a program, it's plastered all over social media and everybody's fans, you know, that program's fans tends to downplay it as much as they can. And then wherever that player is going to go or commit to that fan base thinks that that's the savior. Okay. And for the record, I love that whole Nick Saban retired because, uh, Hey man, there's more room for the Georgia Bulldogs. I mean, not that Alabama was, you know what I'm saying? You know, Alabama did get us whatever, 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 man. Alabama did get us this year, but we ain't worried about y'all. And we know why y'all really left, man, because y'all y'all know we got that number one class, 2024. We got the number one class. We got a lot of guys returning. Nick Saban knew, his, knew a lot of his kids was, was probably about to leave for the portal anyway. So he said, bro, let me get on up out of here because I can't compete with these other schools and, and this NIL money and stuff like that. So should we be worried? No, Georgia fans, we happy. The SEC happy. You know what I'm saying? Because that's, that's one less contender. And I think, and, and we'll talk about uh, Kalen DeBoer another day. I don't think he's a, I think he's a good coach, but he's in a bad situation right now if he can't plug these leaks at Alabama. But let's, let, let's go, go ahead, Joe. I'm going to let you cook. So it's 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 one of two reactions. Both of them are wrong because it's always more than nothing. And yet it's always less than everything when these kids leave and transfer and move spots. So from Alabama's perspective, I'm sure that there has been some sentiment within the fan base that this guy is falling. Nick Saban walks out the door. A number of transfers walk out the door. And I think it's fair to ask, like, what does this mean? Where are we headed now with Alabama football? And I think that it's it's appropriate. And I and I said this on social. If you want to follow me personally on Twitter, I'm at Joel Clatt. And I said this out there on Twitter. Hey, I'm following you on Twitter, Joe. Give me Joel. Give me a give me a follow, man. Let's get it. I just basically said they should be fine. Kalen DeBoer is an unbelievable coach, and yet. There's just no way that they can sustain the level of dominance that they have sustained for the last 16 years plus. With hey, Kalen DeBoer is a heck of a football coach. You saw what he did with Washington and Michael Penix. And all, you know, he, hey, man, he did that. He did that. He beat Texas, the team that beat Alabama. He did that. I, think, I don't think it's a coaching issue. I think it's a opportunity for players to, you know, get from up under Alabama if they want to leave. A lot, of, a lot of kids going back home, like Caden Proctor's going back home. I knew he, I said he was going back home once he hit the portal because if you if you know anything about Caden Proctor, when he committed, it was between Alabama and Iowa. And I said when he committed to, and signed to Alabama that he should have never signed to Alabama. He should have signed to Iowa, and that would have been a much better fit for him. Even though he did, he did a good job for Alabama. I know we, I know I killed him and other people Nick picked him and all that stuff, but. He played well as a true freshman at Alabama, but he should have stayed in. He should have stayed at Iowa. Nick Saban, and I got a lot of like, duh, Clat, like, oh, uh, tell me something, breaking news. Blah, blah, blah. But in all honesty, it's it's true. And and the problem is, is that I don't know if Alabama's fans, I don't know if you tied fans, have really gravitated towards this and actually grasped what that means. What does it actually mean? What you're dealing with right now? Because it's not going to be as dominant as it was under Nick Saban. It's not going to be as easy as it was under Nick Saban. This man was the greatest college football coach in history. You were just on the greatest run that we've ever seen from any program in the history of the sport. That's not going to continue. It's just not. And what you're starting to see is the evidence of that. 
with some of these exits. So what are we seeing with Alabama? Well, last year's team, number one team in terms of the talent composite in college football. There was not a more talented team in college football. In fact, 74 players on the Alabama team last year were either four or five-star recruits when they came to Alabama. That number is staggering, to be quite honest with you. That's the reason that they were the number one composite team in college football. Now, it didn't work out for them, and now they're losing a lot of guys. Now, you can get any number of different total number from uh, of transfers. Some of them might be like Waterboy walk-ons. Others are five-star SEC freshman of the year, Caleb Downs, right? So you're going to get the entire spectrum of guys that are leaving Alabama. So the total number I'm, I'm not quite as interested in as I am what is the elite talent that is leaving Alabama? So let's just look at the four and five star players that were recruited as four and five star players that are going to walk out the door. So you've got the best coach in history walking out the door and then how many elite blue chip prospects and that number is 12. Okay, 12. A lot. 12 is a lot for every program in the country outside of like three. And one of those three is Alabama. Why? Because they had 74 guys that were four and five star players on their roster to begin with. Now, this is not an exact science because some of those players are also going to leave for the draft. And I understand that. But it does give you at least just some context for what's going on at Bama. So is the sky falling? No, of course not. Did they lose more blue chip players than anybody else? Yes. Yes, they did. But they can handle it. And in so many ways, Alabama was built for this. These transitions are always going to be messy. And in particular, when you don't have the succession model that you've seen at Oklahoma or Ohio State with Lincoln Riley after Bob Stoops, with Ryan Day after Urban Meyer, when you don't have the succession model, it can get messy. And by the way, we're starting to see these coaching moves and how it materializes in the new era of transfer portal and NIL. And guess what? I'm not sure that the succession model would have worked as well as it did for Oklahoma and Ohio State if you tried to do that now. Coaching changes are just going to be messy, regardless of how well your organization is built. And you can make an argument that Alabama is, is built as well as anybody Certainly, the talent composite would uh, back that up. So 12 blue chip players, that's a lot. Among those, pretty elite players. Safety, Caleb Downs. He was a second-team All-American. Their starting left tackle, Caden Proctor. He was a true freshman, started every game. Isaiah Bond, excellent wide receiver. He's headed to Texas. Proctor's headed to Iowa. Um, Amari Nyblack, he was a really good tight end. He was, what, their second-leading receiver on the team. Um, Des Ricks, he was a former top 50 recruit, a guy that just signed and, and committed and was just there as a true freshman in the spring of his senior year. Julian saying, uh, saying, sorry, you're telling me, never mind. There's, there's too many puns in there. Julian saying, even though he's not a factor on that roster, even last fall, he's transferring out. So that's the number of guys. Those are some of the blue chip Guys are going to be losing their top three leading receivers from last year. Burton going to the draft. Bond and Nye Black both transferring to Texas. Their second leading rusher, Roydell Williams, he's transferring to Florida State. So then the question becomes like, okay, what's the answer? What's the fix? What's Kalen DeBoer going to do? Because he's... And I'll say this. I've said this all season that... Alabama didn't even start some of their best players. Like they are low. They like like he said, they are freaking low. Like if there's a team that's loaded, it's Alabama. Like I had a couple. I had a lot of linemen rated higher than Caden uh, Caden Proctor coming out of high school, um, but they weren't six eight three fifty. They're like six six three fifteen three oh five three ten. Uh, you know, but I thought they out of high school, out of the box, I thought some of those guys was a little bit better than Caden coming out in the 2023 and the 2022 class. Uh, but they weren't 6'8", 350. <laughs> they, they just wasn't that. And Caden Proctor's grade was comparable to theirs, but I had some kids like Mark like eight, ten points higher than than Caden Proctor's uh sophomore tape, junior tape. Um I think I think Alabama would be fine, honestly. Uh, we really look at it and see 
who who they have on the roster like it's a lot of kids on that roster that you ain't even that you've heard of but you haven't heard of them at the college level they got keon keely they got they got a whole they got a whole lot of they got a lot man i gotta go back and look at my list but alabama is loaded i don't think they lost enough to really be out of contention for the playoffs but they did they're gonna take a hit they're gonna take a hit he's got to stop this at some point within this 30-day window that these players have autonomy and agency and can jump He's got to do something. Now, I don't think that that means just like bring in all new guys. He's got to circle the wagons and retain the roster. And it looks like he's doing that to some degree as, as best as he can. Heck, he's got 74 guys that are blue chip players. I mean, a lot of guys are staying. Jalen Milrow hasn't jumped, you know, and that's a fit that I'm not sure what it's going to look like with him and Kalen DeBoer, but he hasn't jumped. Is he going to re recruit wide receiver talent? Is he going to get the right quarterback? Is he going to get the right offensive lineman? This is one question, and I didn't bring this up when we were talking about Kalen DeBoer and just like uh, the, the, the Saban news on previous shows. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be a pessimist here, but I, I would say the only thing that I wouldn't say DeBoer has shown a, a real elite nature with is in recruiting. Okay, and, and that's something that Alabama's going to expect is that their roster resembles what Nick has built for the last basically decade and a half. I think that you can argue that after these exits, there's still going to be a top five roster, which guess what? They're still probably going to be just fine. But it does, you know, beg the question, what is DeBoer going to be able to build? So he gets Austin Mack out of the transfer portal, his former school, Washington. He was a red shirt last year and a top 75 player in last year's class. Probably he's a quarterback. He's going to re be replacing basically Julian Sayan. Uh, he got a, his really good center, Parker Brailsford from Washington. He was a freshman All-American, so he can replace McLaughlin, who left. They got out of the portal uh, LT Overton. He was one of the top portal transfers before Downs jumped. He's a former five-star. He was at Texas A&M. Damani Jackson, really good corner, five-star player from USC. Both of those guys transferred and committed to Alabama when Saban was still the coach. So that's interesting, and, and no movement on those guys as of right now. So where does that leave Alabama in the SEC? Where are we at? And this is where this is where it's going to get a little this is where the, the separation is going to happen. Because I think that everyone's acknowledging that's like, oh, well, yeah, you know, this can't continue. And Nick was great. And, you know, we, we were on this great run. So, you know, I get it. But DeBoer is great. And and. I don't think what people are, are realizing is that the expectation is not going to change. This is, and I've heard this from Bama fans. So this is, this is me basically reporting. Like this is what you have told me is that you're spoiled. All right. What in 2009 and 10 and 11 was electric environments and, and such an excitement about what was going on in the program and the wins that were taking place, regardless of who they were taking place over turned into this is what should happen okay i think that alabama fans to some degree and nick saban has talked about this by the way in press conferences right after games he's talked about the entitlement of the fans but they have got to be fair you have a kind of a right to be entitled you know but you know even though georgia been you know whipping that tail for the last couple of years but i mean like i said y'all gotta just see whatever whatever whatever, whatever. <laughs> but Alabama fans, the, the standard is high. You had the most winningest coach, the greatest coach in college football history, as many would say. Maybe I would even probably agree with that sentiment. But uh, it's, a, it's a new day, new day, new era, new time, a new coach. And I think Kalen DeBoer is a good coach. I don't know what he is on the recruiting front, but you saw what he did with Washington. I didn't think most people didn't pick Washington to make it that far into the at, at, at that point in the season. Uh, I know I'm pretty sure they won the preseason favorite like that. So, And that's not going anywhere. That's not going anywhere. So Bama 
is not going to be what they were. And yet, that's going to be the expectation. It's just going to be. They're going to expect that they're in the playoff. They're going to expect that they're competing for and winning the SEC championship. And, and here's the thing. With what's going on in the transfer portal, if you look at the rosters right now, I think that it's fair, it's fair to say that Georgia and Texas are the better programs right now. I think that that's fair. Even as much as I love Kalen DeBoer, and I'm not saying that they can't go win the SEC because obviously they, they can, but Georgia, with what they do in recruiting and what Texas has been able to do with Steve Sarkeesian, with Texas going to the playoff, with Georgia winning back-to-back -back national championships over the last couple of years, I think it's fair to say that those two programs right now have a lead over Alabama. So now all of a sudden, Bama is going to be thrown into this mix where they're going to have to compete with and knock back kind of the next six because there are teams like raring to go, chomping at the bit. You know, Venables has recruited well at Oklahoma. Ole Miss has done an amazing job. Lane Kiffin, the you know, the portal king. LSU is not going anywhere. You know that they're going to be motivated. Tennessee feels like they've they've done a nice job. Mizzou feels like they're on the up. You know, Auburn is still going to be Auburn, in particular in the Iron Bowl. And, and yet, the expectation is going to remain. So now you're entering into a super conference. I don't think you're in the in the lead or the preeminent spot in that conference anymore. And I do think that that's fair with Georgia and Texas and what they've done over the last couple of seasons. And yet the expectation is going to remain. So that leaves us now with Kalen DeBoer at Alabama with a roster that's not quite a Nick Saban roster against a league that's going to be better than what the league has been in, in past years. And he's going to be expected to compete at the highest level and definitely go to an expanded playoff. Because even missing the four-team playoff was like an aghast to the to the Alabama fans. It's like, what? Well, we can't miss the playoff. And that was a four-team playoff, and they didn't miss it often. No, no, no. They were always in there. You can ride them in there at the beginning of the season. Even in a year like this last fall, when we didn't think that they would get there, guess where they were at the end? In the playoff. And so now it's expanding to 12. And you think for one moment, that those fans won't absolutely revolt if they miss the playoff. So now I don't think I don't think that Alabama will fall outside the, the top twelve. I just I don't even with the kids that they lost, I just don't see them falling outside the, the top twelve. I just don't I don't see that happening. Would they be in the top four, top six? I don't know. Could be. I think the talent is there. But like you said, you're losing a lot of people. And then you got to bring your guys in. Because those were Nick Saban's kind of players. I haven't heard Clack talk about that that portion. He he mentioned he mentioned it a little bit. But these are Nick Saban's players that Kalen DeBoer currently has. So, yes, they are 74 blue chippers. Uh, but these are Nick Saban players. These aren't. Kalen DeBoer players like Kalen DeBoer's offensive line <laughs> doesn't look anything like Nick Saban's offensive line. He doesn't even carry those. I only think he had a whole bunch of 350 plus offensive linemen at, at Washington because they wanted to throw that rock. So they had a little bit leaner. So we don't know what what Kalen's team is going to look like in Alabama. All I know is that this is Nick Saban's roster currently, and we'll have to see what happens in the future. What well, comes down to just like total number of losses, okay? And and you start to look at the schedule and you start to think to yourself, all right, what's the minimum here? I think that three losses is the max that a team can have and, and still go to the playoff. I just don't see the four loss team still getting into the playoff. Maybe I'm wrong. And, and again, I don't know exactly how this is all going to play out in the expanded playoff, but three to me just seems like the number for some of these at-large teams, specifically in the SEC and in the Big Ten. That's where the, the majority of the at-large teams will come from. I don't see over, you know, maybe there's a second team from some of these other leagues, but probably not. Probably not. Their champions are going to get in, and then the at-large teams are, are widely going to be coming from the SEC and from the Big Ten. And I think three is probably the number as far as losses. I think over that is, is interesting. So here comes the toughest games. And Alabama is going to be tough playing a ridiculously tough schedule. They've got to go to Wisconsin. 
Now, again, are they going to be favored against Wisconsin? Yeah, probably, but it's on the road. They've got to play Georgia. At least that's at home. They've got to go to Tennessee. That's a tough place to play. They've got to play Missouri, and that's an up-and-coming team. They've got to go <laughs> to Death Valley and go to LSU. Pray that that one's not at night. They've got to go to Oklahoma, a place that they haven't really been and is, you know, tough place to play, and they have the Iron Bowl. So Caleb DeBoer's got his work cut out for him. So is it time to panic at Alabama? No. But is it going to look the same? No. No, it's not going to look the same. I know that they were looking for, you know, possible transfers to come in. Uh, I think DeBoer and his recruiting style is going to be under scrutiny because it's not like he was churning out top five classes at Washington, mm -hmm. even though I know that he's a great coach. Like, guys, I know he's a great coach. And can he get it done at Alabama? Absolutely. And this first year remains to be seen. I know that he was after Noah Fafita and Tedero McMillan. At Arizona, didn't get them down. Those those guys, Fafita and McMillan, are going to stay in Tucson. Um, so that's a big pickup for Brent Brennan. Uh, Fafita and McMillan are excellent players, are really the reason and the drivers for Jed Fish to get that 10 wins. Then Fish bolts, and he's now in Seattle, taking over DeBoer's job at Washington as DeBoer takes over for Nick Saban. They're all trying to get each other's players. And guess what? Fafita and McMillan are staying put in Tucson. So good for them. It's not a demise at Alabama, but it, it is it is certainly, you know, a, a trimmer. And there's always going to be people that are lurking, programs that are lurking. Because when, when someone is reeling, someone else is going to be trying to take advantage. That's just the nature of, of this business. That's the nature of college football. And at least for this week, and we'll see how it is moving forward, but at least for this week, the program that took most advantage of the situation was Ohio State. And what was Alabama's loss, in particular with Caleb Downs, which is now kind of the biggest transfer in the college football landscape, was Ohio State's gain as Downs goes to Ohio State. Now, early in this process, it was... Now, I'm highly upset that Caleb Downs went to Ohio State over Georgia. I just knew he was coming back home to Ohio, to, uh, to Georgia, but hey, man, it's cool. It's all right. It's cool. Projected 100% that he was going to go to Georgia. So this is a major win for Ohio State to get a player. The caliber of Caleb Downs, a bit of their own version of unfinished business. And now you add what I think is one of the best defensive players in the country. I don't agree with that statement. Uh, I, I think, like I say, this is, you know, a little hype train by Mr. Clack, Coach Clack, but I don't agree with that sentiment, man. If you watch that Texas game, he struggled a little. Now, he's a true freshman, like I'm saying. I'm, I'm just saying, I don't think he, I think this is a little bit of a, you give him a little two-hand love on this one, but I think, and like I said, I wanted Caleb Downs in, in Georgia, but at the same time, I don't think he was like the best safety in the nation. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> like, that's crazy. That's way too, that's way too much praise um, but he's definitely a good player. He's definitely a good player. That's a huge get, a huge get for Ohio State. Now, I'm going to come back to, before we get through into all this Ohio State stuff, I'm going to come back to this. Remember, if you're talking about from an Alabama perspective and an Ohio State perspective, Ohio State thinks of like, well, now we're going to win the national championship. You're not. You're not. You got to go through a lot of people to get to the national championship. And from Alabama's perspective, it can be sky is falling. It's not sky is falling, and it's not guaranteed that you're going to win the national championship. It's always somewhere in the middle. It's always somewhere in the middle because it's just one player. All right? And, and I would think, and the way that Alabama is built, that they can move forward from this. But it's still a massive get on the um, Ohio State side. So they get Caleb Downs. They also get Julian Sain, who, again, hasn't taken a stat, snap yet in college football and I, I'm going to refrain for calling this like giant yes he was rated basically the best quarterback in this last class him and Dylan Rayola Rayola went to Nebraska I'm gonna tell y'all you hear you hearing it here first Julian saying going to Ohio State was the worst decision he could have made why because there's a dude there by the name of Aaron Nolan one of the most decorated most productive quarterbacks to ever come out of the state of Georgia 
He he was ready to four star. I don't really stars don't really mean nothing to me. Just turn on the tape and watch both of them boys play, and you'll see that. It ain't it ain't it ain't just Julian Sayans team. They gonna they gonna they make it an opportunity for these two for Julian and and Aaron Nolan to compete head to head for that starting that start starting spot and let the best man win, not taking in the stars or the NIL money. Aaron Nolan could take this position. That's all I'm saying. All I'm saying. I'm just leaving it at that. It ain't a, it ain't a done deal for Julian saying that Ohio State. Uh, saying now he enrolled at Alabama for this his spring of his senior year, and then he's now in the portal, and he is now committing and going to Ohio State. So that's that's huge, and now Ohio State is is all loaded up. Okay, so now let's talk about Ohio State for a moment, and and let's bring it back to this this notion and this fact that there is no greater motivator on earth than when your heated rival wins a national championship or has any success you know it and i know it in our personal lives it, it remains true but it certainly remains true in college football let me just get, give you and i was going to do this a little bit later but I'm, before i get into this ohio state stuff i just want to take you through a brief history of college football and how rivals are so good for each other yes we hate each other and yet we need each other desperately. Why? Because it drives each other to greatness. And this is what I love about college football. You look back at some of like the blue blood, cream of the cream, top of the crop rivalries in college football and how they started to trade national championships. Why? Because it's like, well, that team can't be playing at that level without us playing at that level. So the level of commitment from everybody, whether it's the fan base, whether it's the coaching staff, whether it's the, the administration, the support, everything around it starts to get ratcheted up. This is the best part about rivalries is, is you look through the, the history of college football and check this out. Blue blood rivalries. I'm going to start like in the 80s because Miami in the 80s, they started winning titles, 87, 89, 91. What did Florida State do? They were like, no, 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 no. We, we're better. We can go and do this. So what do they do? They win a title in 92 or excuse me, finish second in 92, win a title in 93. And then they win another title in 99. What happens after 99? Miami's like, nope. This is our role. What do they do? Second in 2000. And they win the title in 2001, finish second in 2002. Think about like Florida, Tennessee in that conference. What happens? Florida, spurred by Miami and Florida State, they win a title in 1996. And what happens? Tennessee, bam, 1998. Why? It spurs you to greatness when your rival achieves something that you want. And what happens? Michigan wins the national championship in Ohio State. You can feel it. You can sense it. There has not been this level of commitment from a fundraising standpoint in a long time. And look at them. Bam. All these commitments from guys that are going to return and guys that are coming out of the portal. Hey, Ohio State had a major, a whole lot of players decide to come back and forego the draft for another year like they like what's the name Jack? Uh, what's his name? Jack? I cannot think his name, but they had a lot of they had D linemen, receivers. Uh, Iboku, Iboka, Emeka, Iboku, Iboka. I don't know how to say that, but they had a lot of players come back. Man, Ohio State is loading up. You can kind of sense that. Hey, man, we going all in for this top twelve. And I get excited because this is college football. It's happened in the SEC for years, right? I mean, LSU and Florida win national championships. Alabama's like, not on our watch. We're going to hire Nick Saban. And they begin their run. And guess what happens? Auburn's like, not on our watch. We're going to get Cam Newton. And then Georgia's finally like, not on our watch. We're going to get Kirby Smart. <laughs> it just goes back and forth and back and forth. And that's why I love it. I really do. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, Florida State's title in what was it, 14, spurs Clemson to their title in that conference rivalries drive the sport and it's not just for Ooh, that's a bar right there that may be the title of the show rivalries drive the sport oh yeah let's get it for the games against each other it's what the other achieves in particular that you want and so here we are COVID year, Ohio State plays for a national championship Michigan redirects replans and starts targeting that goal they now win a national championship. What happens? And you can feel it. You can sense it. Ohio State transitioning, regathering the troops, if you will, and, and forming a new plan to go out there 
and, and try to compete and win a national championship. And I love it. I love everything about it. So what happens? Well, here's what happens. For the last month, Ryan Day has committed fully basically to fundraising and, and diving into NIL. And it's not just to go out into the transfer portal. See, that's where I think people get it wrong. It was to retain their own players. That cost Ohio State a lot of money. Think about all these guys that are returning for 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 Ohio State. This this ain't for free, by the there way. You go, Jack Sawyer, and you know I like y'all know I love me running back, and Travion Henderson is is a running back. He a running back. I like Jack Sawyer a little bit better than JT, but I think this is it's pretty even. JT may it may end up going higher in the draft, but they whenever they declare. But I don't know. I just like Jack Sawyer a little bit better. Travion Henderson, Emeka Abuka, JT Tuimoloau, Jack Sawyer, Denzel Burke, Donovan Jackson, Tyleek Williams, Lathan Ransom, Jordan Hancock, Ty Hamilton, Cody Simon. I listed off a bunch more than what you're seeing on the screen. The one on the screens are just like the big ones. I mean, it's wild. That costs a lot of money. So what does he do? He's got to go and fundraise. And think about this too, like, there was a bit of a, a moment of necessity for for Ryan Day to do this. Why? They're in a transition for, for president at Ohio State. They were in a transition at athletic director. So Gene Smith stepping away. And before Ross Bjork gets hired from Texas A&M, it's like, well, who's going to do this? Well, that necessity and that void was filled by Ryan Day. And Ryan goes out there and pours himself into that and says, no, 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 okay, let's commit, let's have a plan, let's move forward, we're close, we know we're close, so let's have a plan and let's move forward in order to achieve the objective. Let's not panic, let's not freak out, let's go achieve the objective. Because from his mind, right, think about this, if, if you're Ryan Day, I'm not talking about a fan, okay, a fan, again, sky is falling, we're going to win the national championship, all the time. And it's always in between. Is, is Ryan Day disappointed? Absolutely. There's no doubt. And guess what? He's doing and has done over the last month what I think really good coaches do. Reevaluate. Form a plan. So he sits there and he starts to formulate a plan. Well, what, what do I need to do? Well, I need to get more resourced. Okay. So he goes and he gets more resourced. And... In his mind, he's thinking to himself, you know, we were not that far off from basically winning a national championship in each of the last two years. I don't think that that's a crazy proposition. Now, maybe now that year they had CJ CJ Stroud on what you was doing that year, y'all should have won it there. Y'all see, you see what the Texas just did? Him, Will Anderson, how, what? How you didn't win a national championship that year? Like, come on, bro, Ryan Day, what you doing? What you doing? And the Texans. That that personnel wasn't that great. CJ Stroud, Will Ernest, and them boys, uh, Pierce, them boys took that, them boys carried that team. Kenyon Green. I'm just saying, bro. That was that's a young team the Texans got now. Y'all should have won. Y'all should have pushed that. Uh y'all should have won a lot for, further that year. Y'all had uh, CJ Stroud. Maybe this year it was it was a little bit more far off than the year before. But listen, I think all of us would acknowledge that two years ago playing Georgia in Georgia's backyard, by the way, in Atlanta in the Peach Bowl, they're a field goal away from beating Georgia and they would have won the national championship. So, so to him, he's a, he's a missed field goal away from a national championship. Now this year, he's got the eventual national champion in their building and they're driving to score to win the game and they throw an interception. Now, I'm not saying that that's like, but in his mind, it's like, hey, guys, we're right there. So let's commit. Let's refocus. Let's have a plan. And let's move forward to execute that plan. Because the only thing that doesn't work at that moment is to freak out. You cannot throw everything out. You cannot make wholesale changes at that point. There was a sector of the fan base that have, has said, like, well, if he loses to Michigan, they've got to they've got to change direction. So yeah, we got to get rid of, of Ryan Day. Are you aware of what's going on right now in college football when you try to make a coaching change, whether it's retirement or firing or just moving for another job? It's chaotic. You cannot change coaches in modern college football. And I'm talking about modern, modern college football, new age college football without essentially all hell breaking loose on your roster. 
because of the agency that these players have and the autonomy that they have to move, there are no guarantees that anything is going to work out. So they've got one of the most talented rosters in football. He works hard to retain some of those guys that could go to the draft and they decide to come back. That's part of the plan. Get more resourced. And then as opportunities arrive, he can spot transfer portal players to go and get with some of those resources and to pull them on that will complement and ultimately be really good pieces for them moving forward. And here are some of those pieces. You look at what they got on the incoming transfers. Now they've got one of the best safeties in, in the country, Caleb Downs. Quinshawn Judkins, the best running back from the SEC and maybe in America to pair with Travion Henderson in the backfield. You get Will Howard, a quarterback that has won a Big 12 championship. Seth, Seth McLaughlin, center from Alabama. And Julian saying, "Hey man, y'all gonna stop discounting my boy Aaron Nolan? All right, Julian saying, ain't hey, neither one of these freshmen took a snap yet. All right, Joel, I like you, but you better stop discounting my boy Aaron Nolan. It ain't that ain't a done deal. It ain't a done deal. They got Will Howard, Julian saying, Aaron Nolan. I think Aaron Nolan to beat Julian out for that 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 second spot." Uh, those are just some of the pieces, right? So you get that with the guys that are coming back. And now all of a sudden you are building something at Ohio State that can ultimately reach the goal of potentially winning a national championship. I think that that's fascinating. I think it's incredibly fascinating. Um, one last thing before we get to the big move uh, on the coaching staff is look at the quarterback room now at Ohio State. It's really loaded. Absolutely loaded. Will Howard. Aaron Nolan, Julian saying, yes, I said it in that order for a reason. Will Howard, Aaron Nolan, Julian saying, I'm saying it. I told you. I told you what it is. Wild. You look at the quarterback room, so they get Will Howard. Devin Brown didn't go anywhere, so he's still there. He started the bowl game. Lincoln Ooh, gave my boy some look. Hey, you see? Hey, look. Hey, hey, y'all see it. Aaron Nolan over Julian saying, that's all I'm saying, bro. Give him put some respect on my boy's name. Put some, put some respect on his name. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying, man. That's all I'm saying. Kineholtz is still there. He's the one that came in in relief of Brown in the bowl game. Didn't go great, but I know that they still really like and believe in Lincoln. I wouldn't be shocked if he's a backup this next year. I really wouldn't. Um, and then you got the two young kids that are coming in as true freshmen, Aaron Nolan and Julian Sane, and they can slug it out. And here's the beauty about those two guys. They can go and slug it out, learn this offense, and and play and develop under Ryan Day. And whoever like loses the competition can go somewhere else. That Julian saying, just go ahead and leave, bro. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling y'all who gonna win. I'm I'm telling you, I'm telling you who gonna win the battle, man. I'm telling you. It's modern college football. So everyone's like, well, why would he do that? Well, it's like because. because. Because it's, it's not the end all. It doesn't ruin your career if you get beat out and you lose one quarterback battle. You can just move on. And so that's what they've got in the quarterback room. And that quarterback room will be coached by a new coach. And that's where we get to, I thought, maybe even the biggest news out of Ohio State. And that is Ryan Day will not call the plays and now it's going to be Bill O'Brien. Oh my God, Bill O' freaking Bryant! The mean you tell me that you talking about the dude that traded DeAndre Hopkins for a bag of Skittles and some and some fruit snacks? That Bill O'Brien? Oh no, 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 no! Bryant, who they hire as the new offensive coordinator. Interesting, very interesting piece. Now, I think it also goes hand in hand with what I was talking about about. Ryan feeling like he needed to go and, and get resourced and pour into other areas of the program in order to make the program as a whole better. Well, part of that is you got to relinquish some responsibility, and he's going to relinquish some of that responsibility to Bill O'Brien, who has a wealth of experience. I mean, the guy has coached Tom Brady, for crying out loud, and Bryce Young. Like, I, I know it, it wasn't great in New England this last year, but Bill hey, name me, name me a location where Bill O'Brien had success. Name me one. Name me one. Name me a location he had success without Tom Brady. How wait? I will wait, man. How does dude keep getting hired? How does he keep getting hired, man? Come on. Bill's got a lot of experience, and from from 
from Ryan's perspective, I think that he was looking at this and he thought to himself, you know what? I would rather bounce and develop and collaborate with a more experienced guy rather than groom an inexperienced, talented young guy with a lot of potential. Why? Because I think they're trying to gear up for a run now. I'm not trying to groom a play caller. You know, and and I do, I think there's going to be a lot of speculation about Brian Hartline in all of this. And Brian Hartline, if you don't know, he's one of the best assistant coaches in America. He's their wide receiver coach. And obviously they've had as good a wide receivers as any in the country. And look at what they're doing in the National Football League. He's a great recruiter and he's a great wide receiver coach. I don't know if if Brian, and I know Brian pretty well, I don't know if he wants to be a coordinator. I don't know if he wants to be a play caller. I do think he has aspirations for being a head coach at some point in his life. But I don't know if he wants to go the route of being an offensive coordinator and then a head coach. And I don't think he has to. And, And why I don't think he has to is I think that the sport has changed enough to where we can value just recruiting as much as we value calling plays. When you're trying to build a roster, recruiting is the end-all, be-all, whether it's... We call that the prime effect. This is only possible because of what Coach Prime is doing. Now, all of a sudden, you can be a a really great recruiter and just jump to the front of the table and get a head coaching job. But Dion was the first one to do it. I mean, he wasn't the first one to do it, but he was the first one to do it in this fashion. It's for transfer players or high school players. Okay, so he's shown an elite level of recruiting, well, that's going to eventually land him a head coaching job at some point. Okay, so he's going to have those aspirations moving forward, and that's why I don't think he got the play calling duties right now as a new offensive coordinator. And now it goes to Bill O'Brien, who's not a young guy with potential, but rather an experienced guy that has been through it that Ryan Day can collaborate with. I think that's what happened. All right? So... You look at this, and and is Bill O'Brien the play caller that Ryan Day is? No. But guess what? If I'm a Buckeye fan, I would take a lot of solace in the fact that guess who is on the headset as well? Ryan Day. Okay? And every single thing that happens in the game plan, Ryan's going to have a 30,000-foot view and be able to poke holes in it throughout the week. And guess what? That's going to make Bill O'Brien better. That's going to make the entire staff better. And so in a lot of ways, I think that this can and, and will and should work out. Now, we'll see if it does. We'll see if it does. But that's the way that that I would look at this. Okay, last thing in this topic. This This whole idea that these coaches in college football, you know, I I don't know if it's possible anymore to actually win at the top end being your own play caller. Because I don't even know if it's possible to do the job of what we think a head coach should be doing in college football right now and do it at an elite level. I think it's it's too much and it's too scattered as it's currently constructed. I can't imagine also trying to call plays. I think that's a bridge too far. We're asking college coaches to be elite coaches, elite GMs and roster builders, and elite mentors. Because remember, in college football, the coach bears responsibility when some kid gets arrested on the team or anything that happens on the team or within the organization or with an assistant. See, in the NFL, that doesn't happen. The head coach never bears responsibility for those actions. Those actions are just the responsibility of that adult. But with these 18 to 22 year olds, man, I tell you what, that head coach, you know, what type of program is he running over there? My goodness. That's the way that we think about it. And so we want these guys to do everything at an elite level. And that's impossible. You can't do everything at an elite level. You know how I know that it's not even done at an elite level in the NFL, and they're not even asked to be the mentor that the head coaches are in college. We don't even in the NFL give guys now the responsibility to try to build the roster and be an elite coach. That didn't work. We tried it in the 90s. Guys like Mike Shanahan and and, uh, 
who was it? Mike Holmgren, who got all the power. Parcells got all the power at some point. There was only one head coach in the National Football League this year that was both the GM and the head coach. His name was Bill Belichick. And you can say he's one of the greatest of all time, but guess what? Didn't work this year. The NFL has proven that you he ain't worked since Brady left, but that's another topic for another day. You can't even do it at the NFL level. And here's the thing about it. At the NFL level, we try to make it easy on the guys to build the roster. That's not afforded the, the college head coach. You see, at the next level, the head coach, if he's the decision maker and roster builder, roster builder, he can have free agency. He has a salary cap guy. He knows how much re, how many resources he has. I didn't even talk about fundraising, by the way. I didn't even put that in my trifecta of what we expect coaches to be elite at. But he's got the resources. He's got the cap number. He can go and he can you know, sign free agents, and then he can go and he can evaluate and he can draft players, and then he can go into the OTAs. So it's all compartmentalized, and it's all super organized and structured so that everyone can have success. But in college, it's an absolute disaster. It's a tornado, all right? It's it's trying to do etch-a-sketch in a tornado. You can't do it. You can't do it. And so here you are as a head coach, and now you're you're being asked to do all of these things at an elite level in the midst of chaos while you're trying to build a roster during a season and during bowl prep, and now I've got NIL, and now I've got a transfer period with the early signing day, and it's a disaster. It's crazy. Ryan understood that. So what does he understand? He understood that he needed to get out of the play calling business so that he could pour into the roster business. He needed to delegate some of that coaching responsibility so that he could dive into the GM and the mentor side of things. And he thinks that that's going to pay dividends for this program moving forward. And it's hard to argue with him. Basically, he's built a roster that could be one of the best rosters in college football this next year. And in his mind, he's not going to be staring in a play sheet every day on Saturday. So now when, like, let's say, like, the defense makes a play, he can be right there in the celebration. And in this day and age, when a player can walk out the door, don't you think it's valuable when that player, regardless of position or side of football, feels like his head coach is on his side and cares and is involved? Not with his head in his play sheet. I think that could be a powerful thing. So that's part of the plan. I started all this Ohio State section off with, like, have a plan moving forward. Well, this is part of the plan. Delegate some of this coaching responsibility. Dive into the roster building. Dive into fundraising and NIL. Dive into the mentor side so that you can start to retain some of these defensive players and then invest in the entire team and not just the offensive side and not just the call sheet and see where the chips fall where uh, – and, and let the chips fall where they may at the end of the day. So where is he spending his extra time? That's where he's spending his extra time, if you're wondering. All right, so Joel Klatt with another banger, another banger, man. He, he I think he nailed it on pretty much everything. I, me and him was pretty much in line and stuff on a lot of different things. We I think we dis disagreed on two different things. One, I don't think Caleb Downs is the number one safety. However he put it, I don't want to put words in the mouth, but – I don't think Caleb Downs is like this number one overall safety. He's good. He's a really good player. But the way he pumped him up, I like, I don't know about that one, big dog. And then I disagree with him constantly putting uh, Julian Sayan over Aaron Nolan. But other than that, other than that, me and Joe, me and you cool. We cool. 